Good morning, Riverwood. Thank you for joining us for another week of online church. We look forward to hopefully soon gathering in person. Uh, if you haven't been watching the videos lately, then you've missed out on some very good lessons by Martin about spiritual gifts. And I encourage you to go back and watch those. Um, I've found them to be quite helpful and, and uh, I'm learning quite a bit. Also, you should have received a handout about, uh, or a worksheet to go through about the spiritual gifts. And if you haven't done that yet, I encourage you to um, go ahead and look at that and take the time to work through that. I think that you'll find it interesting and you'll probably actually learn quite a bit about yourself and, and it may help steer you on uh, what some of your strengths are and, and ways that you'll be able to serve better uh, at church and to uh, serve God. I'm thankful that uh, recently I've been put before the congregation to serve as one of the elders. Um, I look forward to being able to fulfill that role and um, I ask that you all be patient with me as I um, learn how to do that. I've been asked to kind of give a little background about myself and I think most of you know me pretty well by this point but um, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania and um, went to college at Harding University and then went to um, Baltimore to do my medical school training. And um, once I finished medical school, I actually decided to move to Nashville to do my residency training at Vanderbilt. And then um, fortunately I got hired to stay at Vanderbilt and I've been working there since. Um, when I moved to Nashville, I, I didn't plan on staying here long term. Um, however, one of my friends from college, uh, Emily Bink Binkley Grimsley, actually uh, introduced me to Wendy and um, we began dating shortly after that. And uh, after several months of dating, we got engaged and, and got married. And uh, obviously, Wendy has been an important part of shaping who I am today. Um, when we were dating, I was actually uh, going to Otter Creek Church. And just a couple months after starting to date, I started coming to Riverwood, uh, meeting many of you and, and meeting her family. And um, I've always been very encouraged by the Riverwood Church. Um, I thank Wendy's family for taking me in and, and treating me like one of their own. And again, I really feel like uh, Stan and Rachel and, and all of Wendy's siblings and, and of course Wendy herself, have, has, they've all really uh, helped shape the person that I am today. Now, becoming a shepherd of the church, I know that Wendy's going to have an important role with that too, and and um, I'm thankful that she's agreed to be a part of that, and I'm sure that she'll encourage me and help steer me in the right direction as well. We look forward to serving you all and, and look forward to this role, and again, I encourage you to uh, be patient with each of the, the new shepherds as we go through this process. And um, together, I think that we can um, strengthen relationships at Riverwood and hopefully continue to um, move in the direction that God wants us to move. So again, I thank you for this opportunity. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started with the worship service today. I'll be reading from Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. 
Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer. Good morning, Riverwood. Uh, you know, as we've gone to a virtual church, uh, you've probably seen videos from all over. So today you get a video from me in the car. So uh, forgive me for that. Uh, but I hope you've had a great week. I uh, hope that God has blessed you this week. I hope that you've been able to find ways to to uh, to show your Christianity and, and love for others uh, in what you do at work uh, and just in your daily lives with your kids and your family. Uh, this week, as I was thinking about communion, um, you know, I, st I started to think about what, you know, every week, what are we going to talk about with communion? And, and, and we always talk about God's sacrifice, and that's absolutely right. That's something we're going to be uh, talking about here in a minute as we pray. We talk about Jesus coming to earth, uh, you know, for, to, to, to give us the hope of eternal life, uh, to, to, 
to basically take the sin that we uh, that we exhibit every day, and uh, and to be able to wash that. So, as I started to think about this, uh, I really started thinking about the, just the way we as Christians can 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 really uh, spiral downhill uh, as we start to to. to to live a life that we're not we're not you know happy with uh, when we have to struggle and and, and turmoil uh, when we when we feel like we've let uh, let our, our our fellow Christians down when we've let God down um, it, it can lead us away from God and and, and communion is a time every week uh, when we have the opportunity to just reflect um, on the sacrifice that was made uh, the ability to be renewed uh, to be able to be washed free uh, for, from our struggles our strife uh, the, the thoughts that maybe entered our mind that weren't uh, as, as pure and holy as they need to be uh, you know if we had a bad week we haven't uh, we haven't exhibited the love that God wanted us to do this is a time for us to to, to think back uh, on God's example on, on Jesus on, on you know the example that Jesus showed on this earth when he came and walked with us on earth uh, and it's a time for us to start over so at this time uh, we're gonna bow and, and just kind of uh, take time to remember and to reflect on the sacrifice that was made and uh, what it really means it's again that renewing that washing uh, weekly as we talk as we go through communion uh, of our struggle uh, it gives us the opportunity to uh, to start the week with a fresh uh, a fresh perspective so let's bow Dear Lord, we're so thankful for, one, this day and the opportunity for this time of communion, uh, this time to reflect on uh, on you, on the sacrifice that was made uh, for the by giving of your son uh, to come and walk on this earth, uh, to, to suffer persecution, to, uh, to be an example, to demonstrate love uh, regardless of, of, of uh, what was going on in his life. Lord, as we struggle on a daily basis, uh, it's easy to get down on ourselves. It's easy to to think of ourselves as less than uh, what we really are, and that's 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 your children. Uh, you know, we are your children. Uh, we are made um, in your image, and that we and we know that through the sacrifice that was made on the cross, through the through the suffering, uh, through the breaking of, of the body on the cross, and the shedding of blood. Uh, that we have that chance to be renewed and refreshed if we if we commit to you uh, if we if we truly repent uh, if, if we bring you to the forefront of our lives uh, each and every day so Lord at this time just help us to remember that sacrifice that was made on the cross the the the, the struggle the pain uh, the blood that was shed uh, and all all done freely uh, let us never forget it was done freely and it was done with the bigger plan in mind uh, it was your plan. It was your plan for us, for eternity, uh, for the chance uh, that, that we, uh, through, through uh, forgiveness of sin and through washing, uh, washing away and renewing each, each, uh, each and every time we commit, recommit ourselves to you, that we have that hope of eternal life. Uh, help us to be mindful every week when we take communion uh, and really all the time of the sacrifice that was made and help us to be better each and every day. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. As I am recording this, Rachel and I are in voluntary quarantine. As I think it's been announced on a number of occasions, my father has been facing some health issues for about the last year or so, and we faced a very difficult decision to put him into a nursing facility, which we did on Wednesday. As they were admitting him into the facility as part of that admissions process, they just normally give everybody a COVID-19 test. And to our complete surprise, he tested positive. So we're being extra precautious at this point and taking some extra things for us there. Now, to this morning's topic. As I have said many times in the past, I try to stay out of politics, but I will oftentimes use the political realm 
when it provides application and insight. And with that vein kind of set before us, I would mention the delivery this last week of the articles of impeachment of our now former President Donald Trump on Monday to the Senate as an example for you. This second impeachment was voted on earlier in the month, but only delivered this last week. And the action of the Senate will be delayed, I think according to latest reports, until about February the 6th. And it's uncertain how many Republicans will vote to convict. It is, for that matter, uncertain whether it is even constitutional to impeach a now ex-president. But, in the wake of all of the actions January the 6th at the Capitol, there were demands for accountability. Someone above and beyond those individual trespassers and looters had to be called to account for their actions. And that illustrates how accountability can become a very tricky concept. On Monday, same basic time, a World Health Organization team arrived in Wuhan, China to investigate the COVID outbreak. And at the same time, the Chinese state media claimed that the virus was developed in a U.S. military lab. It said that this nation was responsible for releasing COVID-19 on the world. And furthermore, the Pfizer vaccine, despite all the trials and the millions of doses, is really just a veiled way to kill the elderly. Now, most agree that both of those arguments are just a way for China to take the sting out of their mishandling of the whole pandemic in those early days. Now, in truth, we could continue this exercise literally for hours. And if we were meeting in person, like I hope we'll be doing very soon, I'd probably pause here and ask for some, some examples from you. But in so many areas, even the creation, again, another item that was in the news this week, the creation of the Citizen Oversight Board for the Police, there's you another example about accountability. It's everywhere. And generally, we are all for it, especially for others. We want accountability for teachers. We want accountability in our schools and for doctors and for politicians all the way down the line as long as no one does it to us. Folks generally run from anyone providing critiques or comments about their behavior. Why? Well, we are in a society where independence is a core virtue. And we don't like other people telling us what to do. I, I read, again, this last week, an article from CNN that said airline flight attendants rate mask issues as one of their top stresses. To be clear, most flyers are wearing their mask gladly for their as well as for other safety. But as the airline industry instituted those mandatory mask policies really early on, the enforcement, the accountability fell on the crew members. And the response is often belligerence and verbal threats and for that matter, even physical assault. And the same happens in the grocery store, doesn't it? Multiple companies are now developing the COVID-19 vaccine. And the next controversy, let me just go ahead and tell you, it's already starting, is whether or not that can be required for employment. Can you make a hospital worker or a cop or a teacher have to be vaccinated to keep their job? 
These controversies, you see, are just another expression of this notion that is deeply rooted in the American psyche. No one can tell me what to do. And it makes accountability a real challenge. Now, in the church, our cultural assumption seldom stays separate from our faith. Most of you have probably forgotten. But way back in the mid-1980s, there was a woman who brought a lawsuit against the Church of Christ in Collinsville, Oklahoma. As a reminder, she had moved to the community. She was given help and assistance and aid by the congregation. In fact, she became a member. She was baptized. But she developed a very public unbiblical relationship with the ex-mayor of the town. And the church sought to intervene, to hold her accountable. They labeled her actions as sin. She said she could do whatever she wanted and then withdrew her membership. There was not to be any accountability. I need not be that dramatic or daring in illustrating this in the church. When I was a youth minister, I was teaching this survey class in the Old Testament. And we were doing some basic instruction and just kind of getting into some of the key ideas. And I had this, what I thought was a great idea. I would give the kids a test and then I would grade it. Ooh, that's where we ran into a firestorm of controversy. Matt, I'm not offering this to you as a suggestion. Learn from my mistakes, okay? Because I did then a really dumb thing. I thought, well, I know what it is. The parents think that the test is too hard and they don't want to embarrass their child, so therefore I will give the parents the test. <laughs> Boom! The eruption of Mount St. Helens, a hydrogen bomb exploding, those are quiet by comparison to the roar that I created. Look, we are fearful, we are hostile of anything associated with accountability, with the A word. The notion that accountability is foreign to our concept, really, of just about, about anything is so common. And that includes religion. But now, here's an important point. The writers of the Scripture didn't share our American perspective. You see, they thought accountability was important. Now, there are some biblical passages that are misused in this area that I need to kind of clear off the ground. I'll start with the most preposterous. There's a statement that Jesus makes in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verse, oh, about 3 or so. And he says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And some individuals will say, see, that shows that the left member and the right member aren't supposed to hold each other accountable. It's an obvious exaggeration, or at least it should be. I mean, Jesus is trying to make his point. I say it's obvious because it's impossible. I mean, your left hand and your right hand are connected to the same brain. They know what they're doing. And further, applying it to the Christian church, why it goes against every principle of good interpretation. Jesus isn't talking about the church in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, some will fight accountability by talking about individuality. And the idea here is that I'm saved individually. I'm saved by my choices, whether I will follow Christ or not. And that relationship to God is personal. Ultimately, it's just between me and, and He. And, and that's true. But that's only part 
I mean, there's a role for the community of faith, right? I mean, how many of us came to Christ without this community of faith? The community of faith that gave us the Bible, that gave us worship, that taught us about who God was and Jesus was, etc. And the final cry is that it's somehow unfair or improper to judge. And of course that starts with Matthew 7, judge not in that passage. It then goes to Matthew's words, or excuse me, Paul's words in Romans chapter 14. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? But the context of both is really talking about improper and selfishly motivated judgment. Nothing excludes mutual assistance and support as we grow to be better and stronger disciples. And I think this is especially important when one balances this with the positive statements that the New Testament makes about accountability. And that begins with our leaders and this whole notion of what it means to be a shepherd. A shepherd is responsible for the sheep. That's what it says in Ezekiel 34 verse 10, where it's talking about a spiritual relationship and the application of that. And Jesus often used that same application of a shepherd and sheep, like in John chapter 10. And so it's no surprise that when we get to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, the writer says, Obey your leaders, submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. An account. I think this is rooted in our nature itself. I mean, sheep, let's be honest, they're not the brightest farm animals. I still find it hard to imagine one of them saying, look, you can't check my wool for briars. I've got a right to privacy. Are we dumber than sheep? If we move beyond leaders, the very nature of all of these one another relationships that we find in the scriptures just shout accountability. We are to love one another. We are to serve one another. We are to be devoted to one another, to confess our sins one to another. And the other side is there too. We are to submit to one another. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Admonish one another. Colossians 3, verse 16. Encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. In all of that one another, I don't see a lot of independence, a right to privacy. Instead, it is swallowed up in the mutual concerns and assistance and help that we are to provide each other. I'll confess that when it comes to this accountability stuff, I'm a bit radical here. And I truly believe that that extends very far in our relationships and connections with each other. I believe we ought to be open to one another, open to our leaders, and for that matter, they to us in any and all areas of our life. Maybe some of that comes because I'm a preacher and I've been held accountable for 40 plus years. I mean, my position is of the, almost by definition a fishbowl. And you're used to being looked at. If you doubt how far that can get, I would just tell you about a woman in Florida who went to my wife and invited her to lunch. And over the course of lunch, let her know the reason they were getting together was because she thought that my wife would project a better image if she wore more makeup and jewelry and kept a little bit better care of her, her hair. Now, I try to appreciate what I view as true love and concern of brethren. By the way, that crossed a line. But, but in many ways, my walk with God is, is better because there have been a bunch of folks who have, who have been willing to hold me accountable. And I'm not talking about the, the, the crazy stuff about tithes.
ties and sport coats and the cut of my jeans, okay? I'm, I'm talking about important things. And this help shouldn't only be for preachers or ministers or their families. The whole body benefits if we would do this with one another on a whole variety of areas. You might disagree with me on the full expanse of that, but I want you to know it can be an incredible blessing. My children were teens in the 90s. And in that era, the internet was relatively new and was fairly unknown to most parents. And I began reading and seeing some things about pornography that was available on the internet and its impact, not only on adults, but on teenagers too. And so I had a frank discussion with my oldest son. And he shared with me that he and his best friend had been talking about that very issue. At the time, there was this computer app. That's, we called them programs in that day. Uh, but this, this program, this app, if you will, that monitored your internet usage and sent back a report to some of the places that you visited if they were questionable. Now, you could cut it off, of course, but it sent a notice that you had done that, too. So, for many years, John, his friend Kevin, and I reported to each other. I had friends. I, I had folks that I knew who lost their marriage, who lost their jobs, who lost their ministry to pornography. And I'm convinced that my accountability to two teenagers was an important reminder and help to me. Accountability works, folks. But we need to understand spiritual gifts needs to be expressed and thought of here as well. You see, accountability for our gifts flows from those one another bonds. And accountability is a consequence of Paul's body image that we've been talking about now since November in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And think about this latter point. What happens if your lungs decide to take a break and to stop? Well, the other parts of the body begin screaming for oxygen. They demand that the lungs do their work. The body is to move and to work together. Imagine that you're out on a hike. And your eyes, part of your body, they see a bear charging. And so the eyes send a message to the brain and the brain sends a message throughout the body, run! Now, by the way, that's a bad message, okay? And that's not what you want to do if you're having a, a bear come at you. But nobody said the brain is always right, okay? But in the image here that we got, the body is now turned around and it's running and our breathing has gone up and our heart rate has jumped and off we go and we're 50 yards down the trail and the bear is gaining on us. Bears run faster than we do, okay? The bear is catching up with us, but our knee starts to hurt. What does the body say? The body says, not now, knee! we got to keep going. What is that? It's accountability. The same is true in God's body. We have work to do. Work to do together. And if the parts aren't doing their job, it is both right and the responsibility of the body at large to keep the parts moving. And that, my friend, is what accountability in the area of spiritual gifts is all about. Look, I know, in, in our culture, we're seeing the 
the fruits, if you will, of this concept of unbridled independence. And by the way, the harm that it does. Uh, there are these moves uh, uh, through testing, for an example, to hold teachers accountable for the progress of their students, schools for the product that they produce. More states are enacting laws which hold parents accountable for the behavior of their children. As a society, we're starting to hold cigarette companies accountable for their products, bars uh, for some, letting somebody drink too much and then drive. Polluters are held accountable for their products. Uh, there are signs, I think, in this broader Christian culture where folks are starting to accept and to see the need for higher standards. Churches are creating what are known as covenants, literally agreements that folks in some churches commit to and even will sign to be a part of that church. And it includes some declarations of behavior. And it can include everything from how often you will attend, what your giving will be like, your participation, how many times you'll share your faith. The Mormon church has really done that and has shown some great success in expecting teens, for example, to commit two years to service in evangelism. Look, regardless of what our culture thinks about accountability, the responsibility that we have as Christians, as disciples, for and to one another remains. So be forewarned. The elders and the ministers and the deacons at Riverwood are going to try to help us with this. If you aren't using your gift, if you're not using what God has given you, we're going to try to help you. It's not an invasion of privacy. It is trying to help you fulfill your responsibility. Raising expectations, really, for all of us, and holding each other accountable to those is a key part of being the right type of post-pandemic church. Do your part. Be your part that God creates you to be in His body. Have a great week. Good morning, church. Let's go to God in prayer as we continue to celebrate honor, and acknowledge who he is and thank him for all that he's done. Let's pray. Hi, Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the fullness of your presence, acknowledging and embracing the fact that you are here in the midst of what we are doing as we come to you to worship, as we come to you to embrace your love, be filled with your love, and honor you for all that you give in so many different ways. And God, one of the challenging things right now is that we're all uniquely struggling in different ways. But God, you know what those struggles are. You know what those frustrations are. You know what those hurts are. You know what that pain is. And God, we give that to you right now. So as we focus our hearts and minds on you today, as we intentionally allow ourselves to come before your throne, to see you, to know you, and to be known by you, that all the other distractions of the world are laid at rest so that we can fully and completely embrace you and your love. God, I thank you so much. For the fact that you have gone to such great lengths to allow us to know you. 
to allow us to experience your love. And that, God, that you were willing to give up so much simply so we could be with you. And so, God, as we continue this time of worship, as we take this time to recognize who we are and appreciate who you are, we thank you and we love you. And we truly give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. We pray this in your son's beautiful name and through the power of the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful morning to come together and to worship such an amazing God. Let me thank you for joining us this morning. And we look forward to hopefully very, very soon being able to be together in person. I do want to let you know of a date to, to mark in your calendar, and that is February 28th. Uh, that will be our kickoff Sunday. Uh, so we hope that, that you make plans um, to join us in that on February 28th. And we'll be sending out more information about that, but just want you to go on and save that date, uh, February 28th. We don't have any updates to our prayer list, uh, but continue to lift up all of those who are listed on the prayer list. Um, Claudia Carillon, uh, Catherine Collier, Elena Grinder, David Lambert, Wayne Pyle, Carol Pyle, Sue Sanders, Horace Temple, and John Tidwell Sr. Please um, continue to lift them up in your prayers. Um, and, and the newsletter has all the information about their specific prayer requests, uh, so be sure and look at that. Also, there are a couple opportunities for us to be able to serve and to help um, some schools in our area. One is Inglewood Elementary School as they are working with Second Harvest Food Bank on distributing food boxes. Um, and so there is information about that on the newsletter if you're interested or able to help with that. And then also East End Prep is looking for um, some tutors virtually. Um, if you have the opportunity or desire um, to help tutor virtually for East End, please contact myself or Rod uh, Bame and let, let us know. Uh, and we'd be glad to get you um, the information um, you would need. Um, and also there, there are a couple of training sessions or, or videos to, to be able to help prepare you for that if you are interested in doing that. Uh, we also want to send encouragement to East End Prep, the staff and the teachers as we kind of uh, work with them. So uh, if you are uh, able to, to send some encouragement, let me know and I'll be able to, I can send you uh, some information on, on some of the teachers' names and, and address to send that to. Um, so over the last year and a half, two years, maybe even longer, you've, you've heard us uh, say the vision statement. Glorify God, share Christ with others through loving, growing, and serving together. And when the leadership team came up with, with this, um, this was not just to be some catchy statement but to be something that kind of marks what we desire the congregation to focus on. And it's found throughout Scripture. And I'll break it down a little bit for you today. To glorify God, it is what we're called to do. It's what we're to do each and every day with our lives, no matter how young, no matter how old, no matter how talented or seemingly lack of talent, no matter what the circumstances, we are to glorify God. He has blessed us with many different things and we are to use Him for His glory. And then share Christ with others. This is the Great Commission, what we're taught to do, to share Christ with others and not only commanded and taught to do that, but should have the desire to do that. And the incredible gift we were given of Christ's sacrifice and the good news that we have and the hope that we have of sharing, we need to share that with others and continue to share who he is and his message, his word with all those we come in contact with. And then loving. And we are taught the most greatest commandment to love the Lord your God. 
and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, Scripture says they'll know we are Christians by our love. So we are called to love. And we're called to love in all circumstances and love all people. And then we're called to grow. Growing. We should be growing each and every day. We should be growing in our walk with Christ. We should be growing as a body together. And we should be encouraging each other in that growth. And in that process, we should be serving. We're taught through, through Jesus' example to, to serve those in need, to serve all those that we are able and that we come in contact with. And so loving, growing, and serving is, is a fabric of, of what we should be doing each and every day. And there's a key word that we finish with, and that's together. Because while we should be loving, growing, and serving as individuals, it's also very, very important that we do it together. That we grow together, that we love together, that we serve together, that we share Christ together and what he has done and how he is working, how God is working around us. And we should glorify God together. And so may we, as we kind of enter into this new season of really focusing on being a body, focus on growing and loving and serving and sharing Christ and glorifying God in ways beyond what we have before. May we continue to grow in that and grow together. And may we encourage each other, lift up each other, and help each other in this walk. So this week, I pray that, that each of us are able to see God working all around us. And may we share in that together. And may we work together to glorify Him this week. I hope you have a wonderful week. And I look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully very, very soon. I love you. Have a wonderful day.